There are a number of words from the Bible that we often use, but many people don't understand what they really mean. Today, we're going to talk about six words that we think that people misunderstand what they mean. We talk about the church, family, theology, and even entertainment. In fact, if it's Christian, we're talking about it. This is the Mike Charleston Show. All right, welcome to the Mike Charleston Show. We've got another good episode for you today. We're excited. It's another hot, miserable day in Louisiana. And today I am joined with Chuck Tate. Hello. And with my beautiful wife over here, Sarah. Hello, everybody. So this is going to be a very interesting show, one that's a little bit different than what we have done in the past. We don't want to do like clickbait, but this is kind of kind of clickbait. We're going to talk about words that people misunderstand in the Bible, and six words specifically. So yep. we're going to cover six words that are people use, and they actually don't really understand what they mean. And one of them is more of a, a King James issue, so it's not really misunderstood, because I think all it has to do is just uh, clarify. But the other ones, um, we're just going to talk about some words. And the whole purpose of this... Chuck doesn't even really know the purpose of this yet, I don't think. <laughs> but eventually, we're going to get into an episode where we're going to teach how to study the Bible. Now, we don't have the, the, the keys on how to study the Bible. There's many ways, so we're just going to give you a couple of extra ways to study the Bible. Okay. And this is one of them on just words, word right. studies and how to think biblically. Uh, and these words are going to come up, and this, these are just a few words. We could have come up with many words, yeah. and we actually did. But we yeah, had to narrow quite a few down. words in the Bible. There's a lot. There's a lot of key words. <laughs> and a lot of words that people don't know how to use them properly. Probably. So. And some yeah. of them are so big, like faith and belief and salvation, we, we cut at the end because they're so big that we'd almost need like a their own episode. Yeah, I would, I would could definitely <laughs> see that. Right. So we just said, well, let's do it some that are not as big, but are still pretty important, especially for the podcast. Like we talk a lot about church. And family, and well, you heard it, and uh, so anyway, we're gonna get into some of those those words. So that's kind of the the purpose is to to start thinking biblically and what how to do word studies and things like that. So we're gonna go through a few of the words and just kind of what they mean. So do we want to give all six and tease just in case somebody wants to hear one later? Mm. Well, so this is what we'll do. So we tend to go a little long, and I know some people want to jump to certain things. Josh will put down in the description, if you're watching on YouTube, the timestamps, basically. And I guess we could do that. We could give them the six words. Do you know the six words, Chuck? I got them here in the oh, recap on there the you last go. page. All right. Okay, why don't you go ahead and give them? All right, number one is repent. Oh, Yes. Number two is sanctify or sanctification. Yep. Number three is church. Church, exactly. See, yep. Number four is pastor. Number five is conversation. Mm. And number six is ashamed. Yeah. So people are like, why'd you pick those? Well, we'll get into those as we get into it. And some of them are more of excuses just to preach, you know, or to, to share some good things about those words. Because all these words, the Bible is chock full of important words, especially in theology. And so words have meanings. And when we talk about these things, some of these are really, really good, powerful words. Mm -hmm. And to kind of misunderstand them throughout the years or to change because of popular theology uh, lessens these words. So that's why we want to talk about some of them. Some of them just need to be clarified a little bit. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. And um, so anyway, and then midway through, this is the 4th of July episode. So we do have a game with Abigail. Uh, I'm not very patriotic, so I'm probably going to fail at this one. Very I got a busy. chance. <laughs> Finally. She's got a chance. So yes, we're going to do like some kind of game show. She's working on that. So uh uh, Abigail, be be nice with to us, please. But it'll be fun. This is this is the fourth. So if you're watching it on the fourth, happy fourth of July, and we'll talk about Chuck's plans for that whole week yeah. later. Also, so why don't we just go ahead and go on, get on into it, right? Okay. All right. Well, the first one we said was repent. Repent. So I guess we should have had the Greek word here and and all that, or the Hebrew word actually. So here's an interesting fact uh, about repent before we really get into it is that the word is used a number of times in Scripture. A bunch of times. But about two-thirds of the time, God is doing the repenting. Mm, that's right. That's crazy. Mm, that is that is crazy. Most people don't realize that, that God is doing most of the repenting in the Bible. Now, that 
sounds bad if you don't understand what repent means. Yeah. So most people refer to the term repent to mean to turn away from bad things that you're doing and not do them anymore, right? That's what most connotations is. Right. Yeah. That if, you're, if you're in sin, stop sinning, right? right? <laughs> to, to repent. So if we apply that meaning to what God is repenting, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. God's not yeah. repenting from sin. He absolutely not. Right, which is another thing that in Scripture it never says to repent from sin, and we'll get into that shortly here. But uh, but that is what the common definition or the common meaning of what repent means, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, because we hear, I think I mean it basically comes from from what we understand of John's uh, uh, John's teaching whenever he was uh, teaching before Christ, he's pre-runner for Christ, and that was his message, to repent. repent. For the right. kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. Yeah. And you're, you'll hear this a, a good bit. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So you'll hear that throughout <laughs> yeah. the episode because people, people, people keep saying that word. Now, I will say this, that in most circles today, uh, Christian circles, that is, it is very appropriate for me to use this word to you not, not, not pick it on Chuck here, but to Chuck, you know, to say to repent if he's doing something wrong, because in that connotation, it, it does mean to stop doing what you're sure. doing, right? Because at the very heart of the word is to mean to, to change one's mind, to change and turn a way of lifestyle, a, a changing. Yeah, that's turning. exactly right. The changing, changing your mind. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean stop sinning, uh, to, re- to repent of your sins, and it doesn't necessarily mean to be sorrowful for this, actually, as we're going to read here pretty soon. Mm-hmm. That's kind of shocking to a lot of people. Yeah. There is a correct way to repent, uh, and we're not going to give you a formula, but there is a wrong way to repent, and there's a right way to repent, and we're going to get into that. So, uh, yeah, so most of the Old Testament references are, are God repenting. Yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of surprising. First one we have is Exodus thirty two twelve. Yeah. Okay, it says, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Now, that's Moses talking to God. He's asking God to repent. He's saying, hey, change your mind here. Change your your actions that you're about to do to these people. Think about it. You know, he's asking him to rethink it. Yeah. That's pretty bold. That's very bold. <laughs> yeah, and ask God to rethink. Uh, to be able to ask God to rethink and, cha- and try to change. I mean, he's standing in the gap for these people asking yep. God, don't do this. Change your mind. Mm-hmm. Well, how many times have we asked God to repent? Have, do you ever think about that? Like, I mean, we ask God for things to change. Yes, but, yeah. we do. So in a sense, when we pray, we, we are asking for God to maybe withhold judgment you know, on this person, or we're asking him to do these things to change maybe a, uh, something he has maybe decided already. We, 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 I don't know. I mean, obviously he's decided things already, right? <laughs> but we, we, that's kind of the point of prayer. We're asking him maybe to change his mind, mm-hmm. and that's what Moses here is doing. Uh, what else do we have here? Psalm 135, 14. It says, For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. So once again, this is just... There's plenty of verses in the Old Testament. You just do a search on repent, and a lot of it is God doing the repenting here. Yep. So uh, why don't we go ahead and just do Jeremiah twenty six thirteen? Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. Yeah, so Jeremiah is full of this. Amend your ways and your doings. There's a lot of amend your ways. So he's he's telling the people to amend their ways and their doing, in a sense, repenting. So that God will repent of the the evil that he has pronounced on the people. So God has already declared what he wants to do. But if the people change their minds or they do what they're supposed to do, God is going to repent. And so once again, if we apply what we think of repent to these situations, it doesn't make any sense. Like, God's not sinning here. Right. He's not in sin, so he doesn't have yeah, anything his, to repent And his choice of. that is made isn't wrong. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's just saying, this is what's going to happen. Uh, do something, and maybe I'll change my mind. Mm-hmm. So here we, here's what we have, what um, Chuck was talking about earlier. Okay, Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah, so that's where Jesus took up John's... Right. So John was yeah. first. He was the mm-hmm. forerunner basically said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, here is where it gets a little tricky. So, this is where the word repent, this is where I, 
I get a little controversial here, and people, um, I, you have to understand where I'm coming from, but I think you understand when you actually look at the word repent, that he is talking to Jews here, right? The Jews are religious. They know the law of God. They know what to do. So when he says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's basically asking them to do what Jeremiah, amend your ways, mm-hmm. uh, make the, the, the hills level, make the, the low places high, make it straight, uh, make things right. And because the king is coming, uh, that is a proper thing to say to a person of who has knowledge, people who are religious. I'm saying religious in the loose sense of the word, right? Sure. You know, whereas, and you'll find in the book of John, you'll find nothing of repent in the book of John. He only talks about believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right. and you shall be saved. So people are like, well, what gives? Does John not believe in repentance? We'll get there. But I think that the people don't who don't have law, people who don't understand the gospel, their repentance is a repentance toward God where they just believe. They believe the message of the gospel. Uh, someone who has knowledge of the law already, they need to change their mind. They need to change their ways of thinking about what that looks like. And so in the same way that as Christians now, if you're doing something wrong, I think it is right for me to say you need to repent because you understand in that context what that repent means. Like, I need to stop doing this. Right. You, this s- is, you need to change. Yes, you need to, you need to change. The bad and, you know change better already. Uh, but it is not a very good and fruitful thing for me to go on the street and tell a sinner to repent of their sins because they cannot do that. They are in dead in their trespasses and sins. So if I'm telling him to give up his drugs, give up his living with his girlfriend, you know, give up his anger, then he becomes He's working for his salvation at that point. He's earning it by doing all these things by by getting rid of it, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So if there's no more grace, then he has he's earned it. And then what's the point of Jesus? Now, obviously, you would say, well, Jesus, he he still can't be completely cleansed until he comes to Jesus. But he has come to Jesus with pride now. Like I have done all these things. We're asking people to come to Jesus for grace. And, and not for works. So for him to repent, and I think that's why John doesn't even mention the word repent. Matthew's full of repent, but he's talking to the, the Jews. Jews. Mm-hmm. So it, it is a little bit interesting there how the word repent is used in the New Testament. So I, the way I always taught it is that I live in a state of repentance. Now, we don't have that verse down here, I don't think, uh, where in Acts it tells us which direction to repent. We are to repent toward God. Now, when I repent toward God, what direction am I facing? I'm facing Chuck, so assume like he's God. That's wow, wow. tough. Yeah. Where does that put me? I know, right? <laughs> okay. But in doing so, I'm turning toward God. I am turning away from everything else. I'm repenting of all those things, but I'm really not. The first, the, the direction is very important. I'm not turning away from my things first and putting away all those. I'm incapable of that. I first turn to Jesus because he's the one that will take care of those things and all those things will take care of themselves. So I live in a state of repentance. I am always toward God. I am facing toward God and I'm not turning around. I'm not going backward. Right. I'm not changing. I'm not repenting again. I have repented toward God and I'm not moving moving back. So anyway, that's uh, uh, that's kind of repentance in a nutshell. I know we have a couple other things here. Yeah, you had to know that the Jews, Judas repented but died in a sin. Yes, yeah, so. so here's where uh, you can repent, and a lot of people will say, well, he didn't truly repent. He repented. Yes. He, and, the, and what we think of repentance is he actually took the money and threw it back into the temple. Mm-hmm. We would say he made things right, right? Yeah, tried to. But yeah. he didn't go to Jesus. He, he tried to undo his sin, and a lot of us get caught up in that trying to undo our sin and trying to stop our drinking, trying to stop our, our sleeping around, try, stop our anger, try, you know, all, we try to stop all these things, which is fine, but at the end of the day, we, we're incapable of doing it completely right. That's why we need Jesus. If we turn to Jesus, he'll take care of all that. For us, which leads us to sanctification, I guess. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, but why don't you go ahead and read that verse, babe, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Okay, it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. 
So it's pretty clear here. It says he repented himself. He he said, I have sinned. He did all the things that a lot of people say you need to do, right? Yeah. You got to come here and say you're, you're a sinner. Admit your sin. Right. Right. Admit your sin. Yeah. You know, make it right. Pay back. He did what John the Baptist even said, you know, like, hey, I did something wrong. I, I'm making it right. I want to make this right. And I said, it's too late. And he was so despondent that he went and killed himself. Yeah. Yeah. If he would have gone to Jesus, though, would right. things have been different? Yeah, that's, that would have been a... Obviously, I think it would have been right, different. Right, right. I mean, all yeah. the disciples fled, right? Yeah. And they all ended up coming back and receiving the grace of Jesus Christ. But Judas, it just he didn't find place of repentance. Just like Esau. We were talking about Esau. Right. Esau gave up his birthright, and he tried to repent. He, he said, Father, please bless me. And he said, no, 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 you already messed up. And he found no place of repentance. So he tried to make it right in his own efforts. So be careful out there. You're trying in your own efforts. It's not going to go well for you. So I knew this one would be the longest one. Uh, so we're already 15 minutes in. Uh, right. But repent. It's, I, I think this one is a, a very important one, though. A lot of people are trying to repent and trying to do what's right. And all you have to do is just turn to Jesus. That is the, the repentance that you need, is to turn toward God. And the other things will, will take care of itself. Jesus is good at taking care of your sin. He's really good at it. Yeah. Good point. Anything else? No, I think we're good. All right, we'll move on to number two, which is sanctify or sanctification. Sanctification. Okay, so I'm going to put Chuck on the spot. Since he really doesn't know the direction that we're going with a lot of this, I mean, he sees our notes and all that, but... When, I, when you hear the word sanctify, how has it always been uh, explained to you? Oh, how's it been explained to me? I've heard it a lot of different okay, ways. This I is really interesting. Have. Okay, but I think the most—I mean, I think the most common uh, idea of sanctification is this continual process of of things being removed, yep. and me okay. trying, me yeah. being better, acting better, uh, are, are moving more in a direction towards what. The ideal would be in God, which right. Holiness. I, what I really believe it means is you're set apart. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And that's that's yeah. exactly where... So that is what growing up you hear a lot. Now, in theology, they'll talk about uh, positional sanctification and then uh, progressive sanctification and then the, the complete sanctification. So they say there's three stages of sanctification. There's nothing in Scripture that teaches progressive sanctification. Now, a lot of people use that term for, uh, what do we call it, a maturity. And there is a place for maturing in Christ. Sure. There's, there's no doubt about that. I don't know everything right when I get saved. I'm not perfect when I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I'm declared perfect. And that's where a lot of people get this, where it's, it's you're, you're positionally, you are these things. But the funny thing is, is you can walk in newness of life. And that's what I want to focus on here in just a bit. But why don't we go ahead and get into sanctification is not a process of sinning less and less and less like most people think. To me, that is like natural religion. Every religion in the world, you'll do that for the most part, unless there's some weird religion out there that encourages more sin. But every religion... That would be humanism. Yeah, pretty much. There you go. Uh, but most religions, eventually you get better and better and better because, in fact, you get older and your body's dying. <laughs> and, don't have the energy to sin as Right. Much. You just don't have any energy more to sin. So. Well, but you did talk about maturity, but maturity isn't necessarily about um, amount of sin. It's not about struggling in sin. So the less, yes. the more mature I get, the less I struggle with sin. That's not necessarily what the Bible teaches. Now, the Bible teaches we are freed from sin from the get-go. We are born again. We are set free. We are dead to sin. We're alive to Christ. And now our understanding of that maybe needs to grow and mature. Mm-hmm. But positionally, that is where we are. That's right. And that's where we need to stay. And so at any moment, you have the victory. You can walk in newness of life. This isn't like a struggle where you have to keep trying. I I keep feeling. I keep failing. Then you have a failure of understanding who you are in Christ. When you understand that you are already sanctified, you are already justified, then the pieces start fitting in a little bit easier. But it's our understanding. We need to repent of, of our understanding of what sanctification is. So sanctify in the Old Testament, for example is to set apart, like what you were mentioning. Uh, it, it's to, for a holy, specific use. A uh, number of, think about the temple, all the, the things in the temple mm-hmm. were sanctified. They were cleansed, they were right. washed, and set apart for a very specific use. Um, that was what the priests, the priests were set apart. 
right? Yeah. The temple was set apart. It was sanctified. The, the tabernacle, all the sacrifices, all these things, all these Old Testament pictures were sanctified. So we understand that in the Old Testament. But then we come to the New Testament and we want to switch all these things to unto holiness, you know, where we becoming more righteous. Why don't we go ahead and get into Exodus 13, too? It says, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. Okay, so the sanctify here, that's like a setting apart of Correct. the firstborn, right? Right. Like, I want my firstborn to be set apart here for a particular purpose here. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, then Exodus twenty eight forty one, And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So that's the priest. Yeah. Where that, the priests are set apart. They for are set apart. Purpose. Right. right. Yep. They are uh, a specific tribe, and they were only they could perform. They're set apart. They were sanctified. Now, it doesn't mean they were all righteous and holy, <laughs> and but when they were serving, they were sanctified unto the Lord. Okay, then next we have Exodus 29, 44, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. So once again, this is the same type of right. thing, but right. not just the priest's order, but the the tabernacle itself, the altar, the, all the things associated with this. Now, if we're just saying to go on and stop sinning, this doesn't make sense. It, right. it just doesn't even, you know, it doesn't register. No. Yeah, these, like, so Aaron, he, he was sanctified. No one else was. So Aaron and the tribe of Levi, they were all holy, and they, they stopped sinning, but everyone else was, was sinning. Uh, no, mm -hmm. trust me, the Levites sinned. Yeah. Uh, we, we found out later on they were, there, there was a few of them that rebelled uh, and got swallowed up. But uh, this is a setting apart for a very specific use. This was sanctified and, and cleansed. So uh, Exodus 40, 10. It says, And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. Uh, the reason why we wanted to use this verse is because of the vessels. That will come important later. Mm -hmm. The altar, the vessels. A lot of that verbiage is going to be used later in, in Hebrews and things like that. And so those pictures and those types should kind of do something in our minds. You know, so anyway. Yeah. All right, so then we have what in the New Testament, we are, what are we, how are we sanctified? How is, we're not sanctified obviously through temple worship and things like that. How are we cleansed? Through the blood. The blood, uh, yeah, the, the blood of Jesus. Uh, that is how we are sanctified. So let's see here. We have Hebrews, what, talking about Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 12. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Yeah, suffered without the gate. So outside of the gate, that's where he died, um, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. So in the, the definitions that we saw in the Old Testament, set apart, but also cleansing. Like the, the, the right. temple tools were cleansed and, and all that. So they were set apart. So Jesus has sanctified us, set apart from the rest, and cleansed us for a very particular purpose. And we'll see that here throughout the rest of the New Testament. Okay, then 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. All right, Chuck, this is a good one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> so this is the will of God, your sanctification. Uh, now, look at the order here. That this is Even your sanctification is the will of God. We are sanctified. So because of that... You should abstain from fornication, right? It's not to stop your fornication will make you sanctified. Correct. It's, you are sanctified, so abstain from f for fornication, for everyone should know how to possess his vessel. Notice the word vessel there, the one that we just read in the Old Testament. It has that Old Testament vibe of in the, in the temple. It is to set apart. These are special things. You are a vessel. You've been cleansed. For a particular use, the priest is going to use you. Being the high, Jesus being the high priest, he wants to use you for his glory and for his honor. And so this is our sanctification, that we should abstain from fornication, which was another word we were going to use, by the way, uh, and we decided not to. Um, but yes, yeah, so we should all know how to possess our vestal, vessel in sanctification and honor. So did you want to say anything there? Or No, I think okay. you covered it well. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> all right. All right, the next one is Second Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Yes. 
So there's a lot in this verse that we're not going to cover. <laughs> but the point being, from the beginning, he had chosen you to salvation through sanctification. So our salvation is through this process here. Now, when I say process, I'm not saying, know. you know, <laughs> this process of, you know, I, I'm a really bad person and I slowly get better over time. No, he put our sin to death from the very beginning. He has saved us by his mercy and his grace. And so now we're through this sanctification, this cleansing, this setting apart of the Spirit. We are set apart unto Him uh, by the belief of the truth. So this, these are very important terms. I think sanctification right here is, is very important. We get to so yeah. confused where it's almost like an excuse to keep on sinning, basically. Mm -hmm. If I uh, use this progressive sanctification and be like, well, you know, we're all sinners, Chuck, you know, uh, you know, just this anger, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. What are you working on? You're dead to that. You're, Christ has already put that to death with him 2,000 years ago on the Christ. You need to reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin and walk in newness of life. This is, this is the way. And I don't have that clip. Uh, but the, <laughs> but this, is, this is how you, you, it works. And trust me, it works. Yeah, that's, the, that, that, that's a key. And it, people, if you don't understand that, to, to realize that it's it's not what you can do or how you're being sanctified if you think of it that way right. but it's actually your position right you are bought yep. with the blood of Christ you are dead yes. in your trespasses and sins. you you were dead in your past right. now you're right. dead uh, to, to sin to right. all together it's it's who you are mm -hmm. it's where it's your position that makes the difference and if you can understand that then the other things get easier. Well, yeah, my daughter was asking me earlier about some of these things, and like, so what about going on to holiness and going? Isn't there this progression? And I'm like, well, no, only because if you look at those verses very carefully, it is because you are this. Now you do these things, okay. you know. So it, it, there is a maturing of understanding. There's no doubt. Yeah. But because I've been set apart, I'm sanctified. I'm justified. I'm, I'm, I'm all these things in Christ. I have victory in Christ. Now it's like put these silly things aside. Put fornication away. Yeah. Put lying aside. Put these things away from you because you are sat. You're, you're, you're sanctified. I was going to say satisfied, but you're, you're sanctified. So I find it I found it interesting you were saying as we were looking at First Thessalonians two thirteen, mm -hmm. um, you know we said that in the New, in the New Testament and as it says in Hebrews that um, he, Jesus sanctified the people with His own blood, uh, but also here in Second Thessalonians two thirteen it says that. Um, from the beginning, he has chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit. Right. So the Spirit has a process in that as a part in that as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you see the, the the Trinity at work here? Absolutely. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, it, it, they work together in this. God is 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 cleansing us, and He has cleansed us. And like you were saying earlier, Chuck, that. When we understand that position, so the, the positional sanctification is a real thing. The problem is we don't believe it, and so we have to come up with other terms like progressive sanctification, and we'll, when we get into glory, we'll have complete sanctification. Mm -hmm. No, your sanctification is complete right now. Uh, that is what Christ sees us. It is our duty to walk worthy of that, right. to understand that, and to say, all right, God, now that that is the case... I got to walk in this, and, and, and you can walk in newness and victory in life. So uh, anyway, let's read the last verse here. Okay, First Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. All right, we're, we're getting into Calvinism here right now. Okay. <laughs> no, we're not. Um, but this is elect according to the foreknowledge um, through sanctification. Once again, it's a setting apart. Those that are the chosen, those that are elect according to the foreknowledge, we're not getting into Calvinism, but those people, people like us that God already foreknew, he knows us already, he has sanctified us already. We are part of that process is that sanctification is that we are cleansed. We are already there. We're, that's the point of faith that we believe these things to be true, yeah, even though I don't necessarily see them in my life. Yeah, that's the question I was going to ask you. At what point? Right. And it's, you just said, is that the point of faith when we believe? Right. We, I, I believe these things because God declared them, not because I see them in my life. Uh, if I just looked at my life, I look in the mirror and go, you still mm. need a lot of cleaning up. <laughs> you still need a lot of work. But Christ has declared me 
to be free, to be set free, to be cleansed, to be justified, uh, to be sanctified, and now we walk into that. And, yeah. uh, and we can reiterate that many, many times, but yeah. that, that's just a fact. We The Bible declares it as my faith now in God that makes these reality. I mean, it doesn't make it reality. It is reality, but it makes it reality in my life now yeah. by, by believing what God said. That's all it is, is yeah. belief on Him. Well, and I think it's really a big deal because I know growing up, we always talked about sanctification and just, you know, I'm saved, but I'm being sanctified. And that yep. whole process, when you buy into that, you really do accept sin and you don't expect to be walking in victory over sin if you believe that. So I think it's very important to look at that. It is very important because there is that kind of um, the excuse built in. Yeah. And then if I sin, I'm like, well, we're in a process. We got to mm. tr- keep trying. And look, if you find yourself in a place where you do sin and look, there is forgiveness. It's not like we're asking for perfection here, right? Right. It's not about you though. That's the, the, the point we're trying to make yeah. is that it's about Christ and he declares these things. And where is our faith? Is our faith in our efforts or faith in Christ? And when we transfer our faith to Christ, we will actually see victory. Yeah. And that's yeah, how absolutely. it plays out in, in real life. So this isn't just a theoretical thing. This works out in our lives where we're not trying to promote perfectionism and that I'm perfect and I've never done anything wrong. But this is where my victory is. The victory is right what we're talking about the, in the sanctification and the justification that Christ has done for us. That is where the victory is. Yeah. All right, so that's sanctification. That Anything is. else on that one? Yeah, I, I think we're good on that one. All right. uh, we, hopefully people we took, have questions. We took 16 Maybe we'll have minutes a, on that one. That's right. <laughs> we're, we're struggling again. <laughs> All right. The, third the rest word are gonna, pretty easy. <laughs> the uh, third word was uh, is church. Okay, so maybe not too easy. I was going to say easy for you. I don't think. Okay, so this one is uh, near and dear to my heart. If you've listened to the podcast for any length of time, you know our stance on church. It's a building, right? That's right. <laughs> no. So that is the the... the the, the, the most obvious, what most people think of as church, right? Yes. Is yeah. the building with the little t- steeple and open the door and here's all the people. Uh, that's the church. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Now here, I might sh- shock Chuck here. And uh, wow. because I do not believe in the universal church, then the Catholic, Catholics' creeds and all that, they have the universal church. Universal church is not even taught in, in scripture. It's a local thing. You have the local church that met in people's homes. You have a city church, the church of Laodicea, the church at Ephesus, the church uh, over here and there and everywhere. They don't really have a universal church. Uh, the problem we have is we don't really have much on the church. So we're trying to figure this out. Uh, in this process of figuring out church. What we do know, it's not a building. Yes, we, we do know that. Building. It's made up of believers. We do know that. But it's not all believers at all the time. So we're having a 4th of July party, right? Uh, since this is 4th of July or the 4th of July week. Just because a bunch of Christians get together does not make that church. And here's the reason why I would say that. Because in 1 Corinthians 14, it lays out an order, quote unquote, order of service, right? But we don't call it the order of service because it's not a service. But there is a meeting, a gathering where the the church comes together for certain things. And there are certain protocols, certain rules that Paul puts in place. Like there's tongues involved, but there's only so many tongues. And then if there's not an interpreter, the interpreter needs to be silent. Now, is that for all time? I don't know, but it's specifically in that group, he actually tells the women to remain silent in the churches. Now, some people might say, well, that's cultural and we don't have to because of the culture. Well, in that culture, is he saying that any time believers get together, women are never supposed to talk? I don't think so. Right. I think that that was for a specific gathering, for a specific meeting, for for whatever purpose was going to be done in that meeting, whether it was the Lord's Supper, the Apostles' Doctrine, prayer, and all that. But just to get together for Fourth of July and we have believers does not mean you have to be quiet. Babe. Wow, but maybe some guys would like that. For what? you to be quiet? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm pretty quiet, but no, women no, in general. No. So there, I think there are certain things to to think about when we think of church. It's not always just the believers. That's called the bride of Christ. All the believers universally, but 
Uh, so I don't know. Have yeah. you ever thought See, about I was, that? I was fixing to go there, so I was going to ask you that because I said you, you know, you made the statement that you don't believe in the universal church, right? But obviously, the church is the bride of Christ. Yes, and in that sense, it is universal. From so, yeah, you need to explain a little bit more. Understand what you mean by the local church, and I know the the, right. the function and so how you city see city churches. They're definitely made up in the cities, and in Revelation, you have seven churches that he talks to, and those churches are city churches, and there's actually. Uh, in Romans and Corinthians, he talks about city churches. There's a church that met at Phoebe's house. There's a church that met at different people's homes. Now, collectively, yes, it's the bride of Christ, okay. the, you know, the, the believers as a collective whole. If you want to call it the universal church, that's fine, but that's a Catholic term. The Catholics like to use that term, uh, the universal church, and all their little children are going to come home one day. Uh, I don't believe, necessarily believe that. There, there's not because If that's the case, then we have one person in charge of the whole church, and we do. It's called Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, He's the head of the church. Uh, so if that's what we want to call as the universal church, I'm fine. I'm okay. fine with that, you know. And, and I could be wrong, you know, but I'm just, as I'm looking at through scriptures and how the church is mentioned, it does seem very localized for very specific people groups. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't interact with each other. Right. But, uh, but anyway, why don't we go ahead and get into some of the Bible verses? Okay, so we have Matthew 16, 18, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, All right, it. there, there's my, my ecclesia, right? My church. So ecclesia is the Greek word for church. So if I, if you say me, keep saying uh, ecclesia. You keep using the word. I don't know think it means what you think it means. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But the, the church, uh, a lot of people want to refer it to. Here's the other problem that a lot of people in our circles that do organic church or house church or whatever, they want to say that the word was mistranslated because of. Uh, the the buildings and all that. I'm like, you do know the word was first, and then the buildings came later. <laughs> uh, so it didn't matter what we called it. We could have called it Ecclesia, and they would have just said the first Ecclesia of, of Baton Rouge or the first Baptist Ecclesia. It doesn't, the word is a word. What we've done with the word is is turn it and twist it, and, and it, it's supposed to be the believers in, in the local area. Uh, I would like to think that they are committed one to another, they know yeah. each other and um, are, are committed for a very specific purpose. But anyway, let's move on to Matthew 18. Okay, it says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So Matthew 18, the popular uh, how to rebuke a person, right? Yeah. <laughs> how, how to make them get right with the Lord. Um, but at the end of the, here, here is, if, he, if I don't win you over, Chuck, uh, I've gone to you. You don't hear me. I bring another brother. We bring a couple others. You still don't repent. Um, then I need to bring that to the church. Once again, this is, is this the church universal? I don't right. think so. Is it uh, just any body of believers? You know, our 4th of July party, is that when I announced this? Yeah. You know, I think it's a very specific group of people that we're, we're, we're deciding some of these things. And uh, then we tell everyone that Chuck's not welcome anymore because of his, his sin, and uh, that's, that's a terrible thing. No, but that, that's Matthew 18, is that if we haven't won them over, then we need to let them know what our decision was mm -hmm. and what's going on. All right, so we got Acts chapter 2. Okay, Acts two forty seven. praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So he added to the church daily. And by the way, it's his church. So why don't we go on to the other Acts ones? Okay, Acts seven thirty eight says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So the church in the wilderness here, uh, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. So the gathering, the, the meeting place of believers. Uh, ecclesia really was a more political term before it was used in the Bible of calling people out. You hear people call it the called out ones, mm -hmm. uh, calling out to public place to make decisions. That was kind of the, the political term that they would use. So in the same same sense here, they're called out to assemble somewhere and, and do something. So Acts 8.1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Yeah. So once again here, we have against the church, which was 
at Jerusalem. So it's like a city mm-hmm. thing. It wasn't necessarily saying all over, even though there wasn't much of a church <laughs> elsewhere. Yeah, it was pretty much that's all over. Right? That's where it was. <laughs> so to be fair, you know, well, I'm not against the universal church idea. I just want to make that clear. I just don't see that as clearly. But I get what people are doing, you know, like right. we're, we're part of the church. You know, when we went up to Ohio, I'm not neglecting them as part of the church. I just, I, I appreciate that they're, they're little, they're gathering, their group of people, and we're coming to join with them. Right. We can still have fellowship, yes. which was another word we were going to use, but uh, well, we decided not to. But with the church universe, like you're saying, what's missing then would be the order. Like the Bible talks about order in the church and yes. leaders and church discipline. And when yes. you meet together, like at a shindig or a 4th of July party, how do you have that there? So yeah, right. like there, does, there still has to be some order in some church structure. We'll talk about that as we get to pastor later. Um, I'm not really too big on the the control aspect right. of it, but there is some order. And if you if you you get too into order, then you turn into Catholic Church, where you have a pope and all the bishops and, and all the cardinals and things like that. And that's what we are definitely going to try to avoid as we get into the next word here. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, did you read Acts eight three? I did not. Okay. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Now, if this is very subtle, but he's wreaking havoc of the church, entering into every house. So I like to think they were meeting in houses, but could it be that the, where the church lived was houses, and so he's just, and it, could, it could be it both. Could be. Yeah. Uh, but he was making havoc of the church, yeah. and eventually he joined the church. Now, here's the other thing. You don't join the church like you do a club or anything like that. How do you join the church, Chuck? Um, I believe. That's right. You get bored again. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and then you're a part of the church. So church membership, we could have done that too, but that's not in the Bible. So uh, you want to be a member of a church, you get saved. And it's generally geographical at that point. And unfortunately in America and all over the world, really, we have so many denominations that we get to pick and choose. But it wasn't to be that way from the from the beginning. That we were, it's just this is where we lived, and we meet with other believers, yeah. and yeah. we get together with other God fearing people. And unfortunately, we didn't do that. Okay, so we need to take a break. Thank you for listening. This is the Mike Charleston Show. All right, we are back, and w- this is uh, the halftime show. Hey. Right, Chuck? And um, we're going to get game time with Abigail in just a second, but just to, for those people who care, and there's a few people out there that care about our lives a little bit, and we moved into the middle of the show. Um, so, Chuck, it's your birthday week. It is. I actually had a birthday on Tuesday yeah. this week. It was yeah. very nice. Family, yep. did. Family uh, was uh, very kind to me and uh, made it really special, so there you I go. enjoyed it. Did you have a, something special for supper? I did. We had roast and potatoes and gravy and green beans and Mississippi mud. Sounds good, except for the green beans. Ah. <laughs> Even green beans. Green beans can be very good if done right. How's mm. right? A lot of butter, a lot of salt. Um, I like actually like fresh green beans. I can eat fresh green beans. Mm. Do you like them uh, texture to them? Or you like them nice and soft? Cook down. I don't know what you mean by texture. He doesn't like, want to taste the bean part. Oh, no, okay. I actually don't uh, mind the bean. I don't like them mushy. That's what uh, I don't like. Uh, you don't like cooked down so much that it's oh. just mush. It's and then good. you're like, no, thank you. Uh, that's why I like fresh ones. I'll eat fresh beans all the time. So what is that called? Al, uh, al, 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 al dente? Yeah, al dente. <laughs> I've never heard it with, with, with peas, but... Uh, beans. beans. Beans, peas, whatever. <laughs> uh, be- Peas definitely yeah. get mushy. But anyway, Poor this was your green. Birthday. Yeah, it's green. Uh, we, what we were going to do was for our game, we were going to have some questions about uh, Fourth of July and American history, and we're going to have some food out here. We're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs, little little, little oh, things. Okay, yeah. And if you get it right, you get to choose. You get to eat one. And if not, it was like broccoli, asparagus. But for Sarah, she would like the broccoli and asparagus. Yeah, she'd be getting like, everything I guess wrong. I'll get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, Sounds well, good to me. You get to pick what you want. But we <laughs> didn't do that. So anyway. So how about y'all? You, you, you sounding a little better. A still little bit better. Still got a little scratchy throat, it sounds like. Still a little cough. I feel like we're still recovering. Like I sit down with the kids and... I think we all really feel like we're still kind of half power. Like we are doing the things we're, we're supposed to, but 
We, we just all feel low power still. Yeah, so going I don't away know. for the week. And yeah. Joshua uh, was kind of that way. I think he's kind of back to normal now, but yep. he, it took him a while to get, a, get his strength back. Yeah. Well, and you're going to be going to... Uh, a trip here, yeah, a little vacation up yeah, to the Carolinas. To go, well, first Georgia, we'll go yes. see. Uh, go, get to go see Sharon and Cade, and then we'll uh, um, be able to enjoy some time uh, with them. Uh, actually, got other family coming in as well, so uh, they're going to enjoy the the weekend with them, and uh, then we'll actually be yeah heading up to a friend of mine cabin in North Carolina. I okay. love the Smoky Mountains and the. Uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to enjoy it and uh, actually have a tag along. That's yeah, going with my us, son. Right? Huh? Yeah, your son <laughs> Jeremiah yep. will be with you guys, and uh, maybe we'll talk about that later. I'm maybe. sure he'll enjoy the trip too. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure he will. <laughs> yes, he will. So anyway, and Rebecca is enjoying uh, her camp. Yep. She's yep. Uh, if you guys know who Johnny Erickson Tata is, she's at her camp right now helping uh, disabled kids, yep. families. Yep. Families with disabled kids, and she's kind of in charge of the 10-year-old girl. Yeah, there's a 10-year-old girl that's autistic and has some other learning disability, and she really can't say more than a few words. Right. So she's like a buddy to her and just gets to spend the week. Yeah, so she found out about that. and. So is it it. a family? You said family. Is it a family-style camp, or is it actually? It's for families, but it's it's for for families that have a family member that's disabled in some way. Right. So So, And and they're volunteer to help out with the disabled yeah. People and so it's it's a really nice, interesting camp. I'd be curious to hear about the stories. Yeah, and, so I haven't uh, talked to her. We just text, but she doesn't have enough service to get a phone call. Yeah, right. So. It's it's out in the middle of nowhere, evidently. <laughs> so so yeah. yeah, and of course, uh, Larry was asking us if we were going to talk about this. And Larry, <laughs> and um, he was like, "You do talk about news, right?" And, and of course, this past week has been kind of crazy in the news cycle, but Roe v. Wade being overturned. Yeah, that's. You know, honestly, if I if I had to sit here and, and give an honest answer, I didn't think I would ever see that in my lifetime. I would yeah. agree. Now, I, yeah. I, this is where it should be, and originally it should be up in the states, uh, decided up by the in, in, in where the states are. But the, the the good thing about Louisiana is that we're way down at the bottom of everything, which means that our moral compass is probably right. <laughs> and, you know, I, I have a hard time being proud to be an American because, mainly because of this issue. There's a lot of other issues that it's hard for me to be proud to be an American. But days like that helps a yes, good bit. Absolutely. And it really makes me proud to be a Louisianan first and foremost because, effective immediately, it was done. Yeah. And we had these trigger laws. And, um, and our governor, being a Democrat, still stands for... Uh, he's pro-life. Yes, he is. And uh, very pro-life. And now, it's granted, it's very Catholic down here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, we, we do have a moral compass down here. Uh, Unfortunately, in Louisiana, there is one judge who decided to step in and, and make himself uh, somewhat of a... <clears throat> A cog in the wheel. Oh, okay, okay. So, I did not know you about haven't that. heard that, nope. so yeah, nope. he he did that. So it's actually been uh, stayed in Louisiana for about fifteen tw- twenty okay. days. It's gotta, okay, mm-hmm. right. So you got this, still got to play out in the state courts, and uh, sure. that's going to sure. happen. Yeah. Um, Mississippi, where I live, is somewhat same. The trigger law there actually has ten days to take effect. Ten. It's a slow trigger. <laughs> slow trigger. Right. That's right. Um, but it's still but good hey, news. Right. It is. It's excellent news. Yep. It is very Thanks. excellent news. You know, I know. Um, I know you're. Politics is one of your favorite things, Mike. Yeah, absolutely not, love politics. Um, and <laughs> I'm you can use in the heart. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, no, but I, you know, I tell people, I, I, I personally, and I'm gonna get into politics a little bit here. But um, I, you know, personally, I don't like Donald Trump as a person. I hear you. I, I don't. I don't like his character. I don't like the way his mannerisms. I don't like the way he handles himself. But. I voted for Donald Trump, and the one reason I tell people I voted for Donald Trump is because he was going to be able to put at least two, maybe three judges on the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. So last week when Roe versus Wade got overturned, that is what I yep. voted for. I hear you. Yeah. And, and all emails for not liking Donald Trump, that goes to Chuck. Absolutely. At, Bring uh, on. <laughs> fellowshipofbelievers.org. <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> and that's, that's Chuck Tate. Uh, no, that, that, is, that is a good point, and we don't talk much politics on the show, if at all. But it is news, and yeah. it was good news. And I, if we're going to talk about news, let it be good news. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And um, anytime a government, like there's always going to be abortion, and you know, just because we have laws for murder doesn't mean that murder doesn't take place, right? right? There's laws for all kinds of things and still happens. But for a government to 
like push this like this is this is available for all. that's terrible and so i'm i'm glad that uh, it was overturned now unfortunately there's a lot of states that it's that doesn't really matter no it's going to it's going to go to the states and they're going to bring this right back and for those states so be it but that's you know this is the country that we live in is the will of the people and when the people are evil and wicked so are some of the laws. Yes. But I'm just glad that some states, if they don't want this, it's actually gone. So I, I'm very glad that Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas are still states that, that I don't know some of the other ones, yeah. probably all down south. Uh, we are Could definitely be. pro-life. I think there were 13 with trigger laws. Okay. Wow. Good. That's good wow. to hear. 13 is a good number, especially uh, in the next quiz that we're going to be doing here. Uh, 13. So the uh, I guess that's it. The 4th of July, we actually we usually do a big celebration, and Jeremiah blows a bunch of stuff up, and we have fun. But we are doing nothing this year. And Take it Mainly easy. because of Jeremiah's going with you guys. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be and, uh, be with me. We'll be, uh, we'll be at Kate and Sharon's. So that's we'll right. And maybe in a couple there. episodes, we'll, we'll talk about why. But anyway, <laughs> it's... Uh, but now it's time... And Abigail is back with us. Uh, she was, I forget why she wasn't here last time doing she the show. She was sick and sleeping. Oh, she was sick. That's right. And Rebecca had to, and Rebecca did a very good job she of did. filling in. But what do we have for, I don't have a clue. I, I know it's like trivia or something. I know this is 4th of July time. So uh, Joshua's Uh-oh. gonna be, you know, we got the little patriotic music going in the background and she's gonna give us some questions, right? Yep, I've got some basically 4th of July or basically American trivia. Okay, well, I hear the fireworks like the... in the background. That <laughs> sounds good. Fireworks can be fun. Growing up, I was scared to death of fireworks. I don't know about you, Chuck, but I was scared to death. No, they never I, scared me. <laughs> I hate loud, big noises, and I, I got—I still don't like them. Like, I like how they look, but I... I, I, I I kind of slink in the background and just hope that, that that little extra distance helps, but it doesn't. It's I love not, them. I think they're great. I know they're great. Yeah, they're expensive. <laughs> the louder, the better. No, oh, yeah. wow. Good for you. <laughs> just not my thing. Uh, go ahead, Abigail. What do we got for us? All right. So I've got 10 questions, and I've made them multiple choice. Oh, so we get the... So, uh, how are we going to do this? One person at a time? Um. Yes. One person at a time, probably like we just did it last time, where each person will take a turn. Sounds good. Okay. Starting right. with starting with Sarah. Sure. Sure. And speaking of fireworks, oh. the first question is, when were fireworks first used in an official 4th of July celebration? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, you got multiple yeah, choice, though, right? Yeah. Okay. There is multiple choice. Oh, it's 50-50. It. Um, 1777, 1779, Ooh. 1781, good night. or 1785. I'm going to go with 77. Okay, don't tell us the right answer yet. I mean, I didn't realize it was that early. Any of them. I'm going to go. What was uh, C? What's C? C is 1781. Let's go with C. 1779. And the correct answer is 1777. Woo! Oh. Yes. So I got one right. You got it right. Of course. All right. That's not looking good for us. Chuck. No. Uh, I wouldn't be too worried. Okay. That, I, I didn't even know if I got that right or wrong. <laughs> Until you, she said. Right. Oh, okay. okay. All right, the next question. Is this another multiple choice? These are all multiple choice. Oh, boy, okay. Um, and we're going to start with you this time. Okay. Yeah, you're, up, you're in deck. Yes. Which president first held a 4th of July celebration at the White House? Oh, I, I, okay. I thought I knew this, but go ahead. Give me the four. All right, your choices are Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, or Benjamin Franklin. Could we do these in order at least? Uh, so TJ, Washington, who's the other one? John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> okay, if someone's not paying attention. <laughs> Come on, man, take uh, it. <laughs> is that your, is that your final no. answer? <laughs> no. um, I should have said that, but maybe you guys are going to get tricked on that one. Um, it's one fifty-three, babe. Uh, the I'm going to go with Thomas Jefferson. He seemed to be a fun guy. I I think I'm going to go the same way. I think I'm going to Thomas Jefferson. Me too. That's what I was going to say. And that is the correct answer. Yeah, you guys all got it right. Yeah. Okay. That was... All right. Feeling good. Next. Yeah. George was easy. He didn't live in the White House. Oh, good. Wow. Good. Didn't even think about that. You're right. <laughs> all right. Number three. All right. Next one. Which U.S. president was born on Independence Day? Oh, there's a couple. 
Actually, uh, you, you get the answer first. Hey, yeah. Wow. So get the get the get the answer. Go ahead. No, yeah, they actually died. Speaking. Some of them died on Fourth of July too. <laughs> All right. Um, your options are Gerald Ford, Calvin Coolidge, Ooh. John Quincy Adams, or George W. Bush. I know this one. Good thing I go last. You go last. You know the answer. Um, I don't know this one. Yeah. We got John Quincy Adams. I'm gonna go with. Calvin Coolidge. Definitely John Quincy Adams. It is Calvin Coolidge. No, yes. no, no. This is this is That's three no, for me. This is <laughs> this is under protest. Did he die on Fourth of July? No, he was born on Independence Day, July fourth, eighteen seventy two, and he's the only president born on Independence no, 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 Day. No, 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 no. Okay, well you can look it up no, later. No, 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 we can no. talk about it well, next where, week. No. You just you want to under protest. I think you're thinking of people who died on Independence Day. Well, there was a couple who died on Independence Day. Yeah. All right. Oh, I was so wrong. Okay. All right. So the next one. You got it right, one, babe? I did. Oh, she did. Three for three. Oh, man. I okay. like this. All right. The next one. Which of the following was not one of the original 13 American colonies? Oh, okay. Oh, oh cool. And your options are Massachusetts, North Carolina, Vermont, or Georgia? I know this one. <sighs> Georgia. Well, you're not, go, you're not supposed to go first. Oh, I thought it was first. No, Sarah's oh, going first. Sarah's, oh, man. She's singing the song. I ruined it. I'm going to go with whatever uh, she says. Vermont. Yeah, it's Vermont. Chuck? Oh, you said Georgia. I said Georgia. You still sticking with Georgia? Yeah. It it's is Vermont. Vermont. Thanks to the song. Yep. That, that helped teach me. I saw you that. singing it in <laughs> yeah, head. We know the song. Vermont All didn't right, make next it. Next one's for you. Okay. I don't know the song. I guess that's yeah. no problem. Mm. <laughs> All right. We have. I have one. Oh, don't say that out loud. So do you. No, you have two. <laughs> I got two now. Okay, I got four. <laughs> All right. Oh, what? Hey. Yeah. She does have four. Um, on the original American flag, what shape were the 13 stars arranged in? Rectangle, square, triangle, or circle? Oh, circle. 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 That is correct. Yeah. yeah. Do you know why it was arranged in a circle? Because it was easy to do that way. I don't know. <laughs> it was so all the colonies would appear equal. Oh, oh well, okay. a square doesn't do that? Uh, no, because you could be like at the corner. It that's... depends on which star you are. <laughs> yeah. How do you know? Yeah. I, whatever. Okay. <laughs> they just wanted to make everything so equal. <laughs> so American. Um, who's uh, next? Uh, Mr. Uh, Chuck. Mr. Chuck. Who was the only signer of the Declaration of Independence who later recanted his support for Ooh, the document? Wow. Interesting. Wow. A recant? Yeah. And your options are oh. Benjamin Franklin, Richard Stockton, Stephen Hopkins, or Roger Sherman. Oh. I, for some reason, just by you saying it, I don't know, it could be wrong, but it just kind of triggered it. I think it actually was Roger Sherman. Mm-hmm, okay. What about you, babe? I'm going to go with Roger Sherman. That I'm going to go a little different out. so I can take the lead here. Uh, what was the other two besides Franklin? Wait. Franklin, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, there was Richard Stockton or Stephen Hopkins. Let's go with Stephen Hopkins. He sounds like a traitor. <laughs> um, you're all wrong. Oh. It was Richard Stockton. Stockton. Wow. Stockton to Malone. Oh, come on. <laughs> we all got it wrong. Hmm. All right. Um, Mom. Which U.S. president signed the bill that made the Star-Spangled Banner the national anthem? Oh, that would have been uh, Benjamin Franklin. (laughs) (laughs) Your options are Herbert Hoover, Calvin Coolidge, Woodrow Wilson, or Ronald Reagan. Oh, those are all recent. Um, I have no idea. I'll go with Woodrow Wilson. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's go with Woodrow Wilson. Oh, you did it too, huh? (laughs) It's like Sarah's got them right. Yeah, sure. Why not Woodrow Wilson? That is incorrect. Uh, uh, it was Herbert Hoover. Herbert wow. Hoover. In 1931. The vacuum cleaner okay. president. <laughs> the vacuum cleaner. Yes. We are not doing so well again. Hmm. All right, next one. All right. Who predicted the iconic tradition of fireworks? Who predicted it? Yep. Who pre- predicted, predicted it? Good night. Your options are John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. Only three? Only three. I go first. That yes. makes your chances better, babe. Yes, it does. Let's 50, go with uh, <laughs> let's go with the the father. I am the father. George Washington. 
Man, I was going to go with that. Mm. And now that you did it. Mm. Uh, Not sure now, huh? Well. TJ was always fun. Mm. I don't even know what the other option uh, was. I'm going to go with George Washington still. Okay. Well, who are the other two? John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. I'll go with Thomas Jefferson. It was John Adams. Yeah. Oh, oh, my goodness. Man. I we think are it was terrible. CJ. John Adams. All right. He predicted, huh? We're going to blow stuff well, up. Well, it happened in 1777. I know, right? Uh, he kind of predicted yeah. his own thing. Hey, he's like, hey, guys, here, go blow this up. <laughs> the next question. Thomas Jefferson is credited with writing the Declaration of Independence. Yes. But he had help. Yes. Which of these people was not on the writing committee? Oh, my goodness. Mm. They had a committee for this? So even back then, <laughs> we were still Americans. Uh, who is not on the writing committee? Who's yeah. not on the committee? And um, Mr. Chuck gets to go first. Oh, this mm. one. okay. Your options are John Adams, George Washington, Roger Sherman, or Robert R. Livingston. I think I know this. What was the last name? Livingston. Livingston. Uh, Robert Livingston. That's not the answer, but I'm just saying he was the last one. John Adams. Was he? He wasn't even. Was he an option? That was the first option. Okay. I'll go with Livingston. I'll go with Washington because he wasn't involved in any of these processes. I, I didn't think. George Washington is the correct answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was me. One more question. Am I right or am I right or am I right? All right, there's one more question. I think I still and have one. Anybody can answer it first. <laughs> anybody can. Oh, so okay. this is a buzz in. All right. Signing the Declaration was only the beginning of the fight to win right. American independence. Of course. How many years did it take to secure that independence? It was like, give me years. Your options are six years, 10 mm. years, 13 years, or 20 years. Yeah, it took a while. Uh, I'm going to say six years. 70, 76, right? 76. I'm going to go six years. Six years. That would have been 80. 80 uh, what was the options again? Six, 10, 13, or 20. I'm going to go 13. It because is six thir- years. 13 is a good number. Good number. Uh, it is a good number, number yeah. but you not for this. Right. Yeah, all right. I'm pretty sure I won that one. Uh, Feeling pretty good. Pretty, pretty sure. sure. I don't know what the tally is. Well, but. Josh was keeping track, and he'll have it down. We lost. Yes. Miserable. Yeah. Well, I thanks two. for playing. Well, there's another game down the drain. <laughs> we, just, we can never win. <laughs> I thought Chuck was for sure going to pull this off. Mm, he does like history class. So I have one, one just quick question. Oh, sweet. Just bonus. Bonus. Bonus question. Um, how many times does the Liberty Bell ring every Fourth of July? And this is not multiple choice. Thirteen times. Yep. Yep, it is 13. 13. 13. Yep. But I thought it was broken. What? The Liberty Bell. So it can't ring anymore? Well, I don't know, but I thought it was broken. The one in Philadelphia? The Philadelphia Bell. Did I just ruin it for everyone? Like, you you were so smart, and now I just blew it. Hmm. So, uh, I don't know. It's 13 times. It is correct. It is cracked. It is cracked. Yes. But I thought it could still ring. I uh, probably can. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. Thank you, All Abigail. Right. Yes. Thank you, Abigail. That was fun. We don't have any cheering for you, but we cheer for you. Yay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll come back and finish the, the three three more words that are kind of misunderstood in the Bible. Thank you for listening to the Mike Charleston Show. All right, we are going to be finishing up here on our topic of words that are misunderstood in the in the Bible a little bit. And the, these next three are going to be a little quicker, hopefully. I know we're going long again. Yeah, Mike, you got 15 minutes. So I got 15 five minutes. minutes a piece. We're going to hold you to it. You ready? We got this. We got, All right. right. The last ones are going to be easy. All right. The one we're going to do next is pastor. Number four is pastor. Now, this one's close, near and dear to my heart. The pastor appears one time in the New Testament. Actually, it appears seven times in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, where he talks about to pastors, and it's not the same pastors. But this is a, this is a, a word. When you say pastor in America... What do you think of? Uh, the man who's leading the church. That's right. The, yeah. the guy who went to Bible college and he's the, he's the head of the church. He's the most important position of yeah. Christendom, right? Yeah. Well, at least in evangelical churches. I don't know about the Catholic church, 
but the um, he's the most important man in church, right? He's the spiritual leader of dozens and hundreds and thousands. He's the one who hears from God the word for the day. He's the one who preaches. He's the preacher. Yeah. Right? Yep. There's only one problem, though. It doesn't really show up in Scripture at all. Mm-hmm. And, and so that can be a little bit of a problem. And so what is this person? Where, where do we even come up with this concept of this person? Well, we have Ephesians 4.11, where we have what we call the fivefold ministry. Yep. This is not the fivefold ministry. This is the five gifts given to the church. Okay, it says... And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So here, here are gifts that are given to the church. And I'm not going to deny, I'm not one of those that say that there's no such thing as a pastor. But it is a gift to the church. And just like as a prophet or an apostle or an evangelist, these aren't titles. These aren't things that should be given to people as a title and say, Pastor Chuck over here or Evangelist Sarah over here or vice versa. Uh, these are gifts. And the funny thing is, I do think that I have the gift of pastoring, but I would never want to be called Pastor Mike. All right, Pastor Mike. That's right. <laughs> Ask Pastor Mike. Right? Uh, I think a lot of people in the church have the gift of pastoring, actually. This is not an uncommon gift. There, This is a very common gift. It goes along with teaching. There's a number of people that have teaching. The way we structure our churches today, though, it doesn't. We don't have the ability to have pastors in the correct way that we use this term. Uh, we don't have teachers even. So, I, I, what do you think about this word? This is this is a, a tough one, Chuck. That, that we only have one verse, and yet we build a whole doctrine and a whole structure of a church leader on this one verse. So. I, I, you know, it doesn't. Should I say it doesn't matter to me? Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fair. I, that's fair because I mean, honestly, I, I'm like you. I see it as a gift. I see it as a gift given to the church. I agree with you in that perspective. The term pastor is just thrown out there, as, as, and seeing them as you know, this is the pastor right. of a particular church. I, I, I don't. Um, I don't like putting that kind of emphasis on an individual. Yep. which I don't agree. I don't see that as being scriptural. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, yeah, it is. It is mentioned in the scripture. It is one verse right. in the New Testament. But um, you know, we do have to have within our churches some structure and some organization. But the 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 pastor isn't the one who's actually um, deciding what all is going to happen and how it's going right. to progress it's 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 a, a giving of, of a talent or, or use of a of a gift that they yep. have to be well and to... here's the here's the problem is like I'm not against leaders uh, there are church leaders and we have words for those already now people don't like these terms in the King James they have bishop and and some have um, I know elder is one of them if you desire the office of a bishop. That is an office, and that is an overseer. And I know that's another one, an overseer. Um, those those have specific qualifications that you have to meet. You have to desire to be these things. And there's um, usually a multiple of them. There's not just one man usually in charge of the church. Uh, there's usually a plurality of elders that are making decisions, but their decisions are not to tell you what to do, you know, live your life. Yeah. Now, we are to follow their example. Now, in Peter, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, why don't you go ahead and read that, babe? It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So this is a verse that this is where the pastor comes in, like a pastor slash shepherd. You know, and there's like, well, here's the example of a shepherd, and so this is what a pastor is. Well, mm-hmm. we actually have a word here. Words are important, and it's called an elder. And so the and the word elder there is actually an older person, mm-hmm. and they are to be an example. And and here's the, the thing to feed the flock of God and to take oversight. And that's all we do as church leaders. You're taking oversight, just making sure everything is, is going mm-hmm. smoothly. Uh, we're not to take over and to, and to control people's lives. And notice how it says, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money, but be ready in mind, neither be lords over God's heritage. So this is where we are in America. Uh, the, the pastor, most pastors out there actually do have a good heart. Like they, yes, they actually do, they probably do have the gift yeah, they and, and, and they do care about yeah. people. 
but the system has kind of put them in this point where they are lording it over, where because they're the spiritual authority, basically, which is not I actually really taught. I actually think the system kind of sets them up for failure. They do. I think it really the expectations does. are yeah. so high that it's almost impossible. To it's impossible, them. right. No one has all the gifts that they, right. they are to accomplish in this yeah. position that's made up. It shouldn't be this way. And that's why we kind of wanted to bring this up, because yeah, if you know been, this, this podcast, we, we, we talk about church and, and all that. Yeah, um, growing up in, in, in the traditional church sure. all my life, I've gotten close to a number of pastors as, of these churches, and, and I see it very difficult on them. Yes, I see, you know, it how, destroys how their hard, family. Yeah, it can destroy family. It destroys relationships. Uh, you can't be everything to everybody, and that's what you're asked to be. Yeah, and yeah. that's the point of the body of Christ yeah. is that we have these different gifts, and we work together. And there's actually more than one pastor usually functioning in a body of believers because you can spread that. Like, I, I, I care deeply for people, but so do you. Yes. So it's like we can, we can share the burdens. I don't have to carry everybody's burdens because I'm the only one who cares. There's a lot of people who really care and want to see people grow and want to get involved in people's lives, and maybe I get involved too much. Uh, but it's, it's uh, those people who are, quote, unquote, shepherding people, uh, that is a gift that's given to the body of Christ, but it no way makes me in charge of people's lives. And I'm not any more spiritual than anybody else. So I think we do confuse that word, and we do have words already in place for church leadership. Mm -hmm. And why can't we use those? For some reason, it came in. I think Luther had something to do with it. Um, but it's fine. Like you said, at the end of the day, do we understand what we're talking about? It's the leadership structure that needs to be changed in, in, in churches, not the words. Uh, that does help a little bit, but I think we understand that this, these are still gifts. Mm -hmm. I don't need to call people evangelist so-and-so or prophet so-and-so. <laughs> you know, that's kind of nonsense. Anyway, let's, let's go on to an easy one. Yeah, so the next one we're going to talk about is conversation. Now, this one is more of a King James issue, I think, because more modern translations fix this. A little bit, and this is not misunderstood in the Bible. It's just we don't talk like this, <laughs> no pun intended, you know. But conversation, it, it, it when the, when you read some of these verses, which we'll read, uh, we have the idea of conversation be a dialogue between two people, like right. we're having a conversation. Right. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It can mean that, but it means a lot more. So right. why don't we go ahead? Yeah, and, the meanings, and this this is a good example of how uh, meanings of words change over it does. time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And so if we just if. if if, especially if you're reading the King James, which we do, um, the the converse, if it's conversation. Now, my kids, I have to explain it to them what conversation means. And I think by the, these these verses, we're going to understand that it means conduct, behavior, and right. uh, things like that. So why don't you go ahead in Galatians one through thirteen? All right, Galatians 1.13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Yeah, so once again, conversation, it wasn't his... So he said a lot of bad things about that's him, right. right? No, 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 it wasn't that. It was like his actions, what he was doing, yeah. and so that's his, his conversation. Uh, Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So once again, we're not talking about the bad things we were doing. We were yeah. living. Right. We were doing. It was our actual behavior. Right. This was actual behavior. So anyway, next okay, one. Ephesians 4.22, that ye put off concerning the, f the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Okay. You see a pattern? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. The conversation, I like conversation, the word, but if you just think of it as just talking, it, it, it will confuse you a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit deeper. Uh, next one, Philippians. Philippians one twenty seven. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Yep. Let your conversation. Go ahead with 1 Peter one fifteen. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So once again, that could be conversation, right? Yeah, uh, it could be yeah. communication, yeah. talking. But it's point. a little bit more than just your talking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very important. But it's your manner of living, how you live, right. how you pre present yourself. Right. And then we have. Oh, first... we're going to go back to subjection again. Uh oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Yeah. First Peter three one. <laughs> Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, does that just mean the talking of the women? No. Yeah, you just got to talk them down. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Get them right. 
the conversation <laughs> of the I mean, sure, her words are very powerful, but it's more in, in how you you how say I things, live. how you yeah. live, how right. you how you're are you living this. Yeah. Right. So conversation, I think this one's an easy one. Yeah, one most was people easy. Are, don't use the King James anymore, and they would be like, well, mine, all these are pretty simple, and that's fine. But we just wanted to point out that there are words that change over time, and it's fine. You just have to understand them. Yes. And so this is one that I liked because of just conversation reminds us of like walking worthy. Yeah. And all that. So anyway, and the last word. The last word we're going to talk about that's uh, commonly misunderstood is ashamed. Ashamed. Now this one, this one's tough for me because as we were discussing this, there are certain times where when you when I when you say ashamed, it kind of gives us as a, the meaning of embarrassment or uh, I, I just I, I don't I feel I feel embarrassed. Yeah. And I think that is not quite accurate. And some of them, some of them, it can have that indication. So why don't we go ahead and read the Mark eight thirty eight? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So now when you're doing a word study... Now, what I like to do, I'm just reading this in English, and I use the King James when I'm studying here, and I, I, use, I see the word ashamed, and I'll click on the, the interlinear Bible when I go to Blue Letter Bible or whatever you want to use is fine, but Blue Letter Bible seems to work just fine. I click on the, the, the verse, and I click on the word, and it has all the Greek words, and I do have an interlinear Bible, but the computer's easier. Yeah, it is. And it is, very much, very much so. And so then I click on the word, I see how the Greek word is. Now, I trust the translators just fine, but... I want to see how else it's used in other places. Mm -hmm. And so this Greek word, there's a number of words when you just do ashamed, there's a couple different Greek words for ashamed. And so I'm curious to see how this one's used as opposed to this one. And they both might have subtle differences. Well, this one is has a feel. When, I, when you hear this verse, do you have that more of a feeling of like you're embarrassed uh, of Christ, uh, or you don't have any confidence in Christ. So, like, I, I see more of an idea of he's going to turn your back on him. Okay, sure, yeah, sure. You... Turn it away. I like yeah. that. Right. No, that's true. If you turn your back, you don't have confidence in him. I don't really get the sense of a feeling of embarrassment. Like I'm embarrassed of Christ. If I'm mm -hmm. embarrassed of Christ, he's going to be embarrassed of me. That's kind of how the word is used. Yeah. These days where, you know, don't be ashamed of Christ, you know, we're going to read here pretty soon. Go out there and tell people about Jesus. Don't be embarrassed. It doesn't necessarily have to do with our feelings uh, of Christ. Uh, like, well, why don't we go ahead and read it? It's Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So once again, if we put this like embarrassed... Um, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell people about Jesus. Uh, that's how I was always raised. Mm -hmm. You know, right. like, go out and tell people about the Lord. Are you embarrassed to tell people about the Lord? You shouldn't, you know, because Jesus died for you and he's the power of God. Well, as I understood Romans as I'm, when I was studying this, and I did a study of the word ashamed, and it was basically having confidence in. Mm -hmm. And does it work? Am I ashamed of the gospel of Christ? No, I'm not yeah. ashamed. It works. It is the power of God. Now, I'll make it plain. When I would go out and witness, and I, I would be struggling with some sin in my life, and I'd go out and tell people about Jesus and how you can set them free, I was ashamed of the gospel at that point because I didn't have any confidence in it working in my life. Yeah, I'm telling people about it. Yeah. And if they were to turn and be like, are you set free? I'm like, actually, I'm not. <laughs> I'm embarrassed right now. So it does have like an embarrassment, but I'm not, I'm ashamed that it's not working. He wasn't, Paul saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm ashamed of the law. The law doesn't work. Christ, the gospel of Christ works. I am not ashamed. This is a confident thing that I can take take yeah. confidence in. So if we turn our idea of like the ashamed meaning like I'm embarrassed or something like that. No, we're not embarrassed of the gospel of Christ. No. It's the power of God. But if I'm confident, I, I like you said, the turning away, I don't turn away from the gospel right. of Christ. I turn toward it. So that's I like that turning turning toward that, that picture there. And then we have um, Romans 5.5, 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Once again, is this a feeling thing? Is this no. an embarrassment type thing? Yeah. No, this is a confidence thing. This is, right. uh, I have a hope, and it is confident. It, I'm not, it, it works. Yes. So it's a, it's a working thing. This works. And then Romans 10, 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Once again, mm -hmm. I have confidence. If I believe on him, 
I have confidence. Yes. And so we have a confidence in what he says. So I'm ashamed is more of like, this works. Yeah. And then the last verse is 1 John 2, 28. Now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That's it. So those are the six words. Like we wanted to do this as a challenge for people to start getting into studying words and what they think about words. And maybe you disagree with us on a couple of these things. That's fine. You do your own studies. And uh, But why don't you go ahead, Chuck, and give us a little recap of some of the words that we came up with. All right. So the first one we talked about was repent. Yep. And when we talked about the idea of repent, it's not necessarily the concept of repenting from sin or something bad. Mm-hmm. It's actually a change of the mind. Change, changing of, of what, yeah, change of our mind. Yeah, absolutely. And number two was uh, sanctify or sanctification. Yep. To, to be set apart mm-hmm. and to for a specific task. And we are sanctified in Christ right now. Yep. Number three was church. Church is not the little building. Yeah. It's <laughs> the people inside the building that are making the church. Number four is pastor. Pastor, one time in the Bible, in the New Testament there, but yet we make a whole big thing of it. There are church leaders, but there should be more than one pastor. Uh, Number five was conversation. Not just talking. Not just talking. Not just talking. It is a way of living. And number six was ashamed. Something that we can take confidence in. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ, and neither should you. You should not be ashamed because it does work. Yeah. He does work. He is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. And if you're struggling with that, you can get answers. You have a hope. Is your hope ashamed? Are you ashamed of this? Are you going out telling people about Jesus, and yet you're ashamed because it's not working for you? It works. It is the power of God. Don't go to the law. Don't go to any of your works. Go to Jesus, and uh, he'll set you free. Amen. All right. Well, those are just a few of your words. If you can come up with some other words and you want to email us at uh, talk at org, you can go ahead and, and tell us some of the words that you've been studying. I'd be curious to hear some of the things that you think are misunderstood in, in the scriptures. And uh, until next time, Chuck's not going to be with us next week because he's going to be on vacation. Vacay. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's probably already there. He's like, <laughs> No, I got maybe half a day of work. I know yeah. what, yeah, half yeah, a day. Well, I got yeah, one, a little day, one day, a little one day. So, all right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. I'm, I apologize once again for going over. Sorry, Ferris. Uh, but for Chuck and Sarah, thank you again for watching. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed listening to the Mike Charleston Show. 